Oh shit, family. The Japanese games industry crashed. Hostile mobile games take over. No dominant console due to the PS3's butt garbo architecture. And mad increase in production costs due to the HDs. How will our mostly middle market market keep up? Well, we could like make like the type of smaller games that make people fall in love with us in the first place. No! Let's just copy paste what's popular in the West right now instead. Uh, Call of Duty, Halo, and Gears of War. Uh, sure, we can do that. So you know how in Final Fantasy XIII they tried to make everything super westernized and militaristic in their own weird little way? As everyone lived on this big green cyberpunky cocoon? Well, that's what they did here too. This cocoon though has a tower in it which has been infected by some type of demon tentacle virus that destroys infrastructure and turns dudes into zombies, but then also it just kind of makes a cathedral happen. And, and so now they send in Barkus Beenix and Anime Girl to save the day. Using big guns, shoulder cams, brutal takedowns, and lots, and lots, and lots of... Which, honestly, should suit Tecmo just fine. I mean, I'm not sure if anyone's properly stated this before or not, but if there is one thing what Fatal Frame, Neo, the later Dynasty Warriors, and Deception 4 all have in common is that these bitches are almost exclusively in washed out grayscale. Sounds like your main guy. Though, as I said, it does have the cathedral stuff. Quantum theory has a bit of its own thing besides the gears being ward. There's giant gold arches, pretty floral patterns, stained glasses, big crystals, big boobies, big muscles, and big fucking copy-pasted level designs that ruin mostly everything. So, the game doesn't play very well. It's slow. Too slow. Aiming feels more like dragging a reticle over solid brick than anything smooth or kinetic, and you also run dash, snap to, and jump over cover with X button. Meaning that you often run into walls because of the snapping when you just want to book it out of harm's way or jump over stuff you meant to sit behind. It's great. And naturally, you also shoot with the ones and not with the twos, which is just odd as well. Really though, the big ruiner here is the level design, and the fact that all of the guns sound like fucking air pressure pumps or whatever. But yeah, you know that thing when you walk into a room in good games like The Last of Us and you see those clearly laid out cover patterns that just kind of make you sigh? Well, that's the entire game. Literally, actually, control c v hallways that link together literally, actually, control c v rooms. Which gets old fast, especially with how non-aggressive most of the enemies are. Often resorting to the dick-all approach when up close and straight up refusing to pop up from behind cover in case of distance. It just doesn't convey at all the all-out viscerality of Gears of War. Health regen is slow, aiming is slow, walking speeds are slow, and while it does have a mechanic in the form of girl-based combos like being able to throw her or hitting a button when glowy circle to do a big takedown, the game feel is best summed up by Barkus himself. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> no music, no fast action, no rapid shootouts, just a mildly disappointed. Yeah. Alternatively, there's also this beautiful moment right here, where myself and the lads were stuck in an alleyway clipping into each other as we spoke over the intercom without speaking animations, only to see this tiny little chain link fence that had kept us cooped up in here flaccidly fall over without being touched. I, uh, I had a pretty good belly laugh out of that one, not gonna lie. But yeah, it's, uh, it's not great. Sometimes it'll feel like it's going somewhere, what with Girl and the funny Ari voice acting in the five whole cutscenes that it has, and the fact that it's never quite bad enough to be bad full on, but it's also very fucking far from being anywhere near good either. Tecmo just isn't the type of developer that could cough up the budget or have the experience to make a Gears of War game, which 
shows in just about every facet. Sadly though, as my little intro already hinted at, I don't think it's like they actually really wanted to make this game. They more so had to, out of fear of going bankrupt. It is but a wee product of the Japanese games industry's Dark Age. If you'd ask me what I think the worst era in gaming had to be, I'd go with late last decade and early this decade. Fucking Western gaming collectively deciding to go the way of the bald man as budding titles that were once cool were rejiggered mid-development to be more boring. Happy genres like platformers, arcade racers and on-rail shooters up and vanished almost completely, and Japan was lagging behind severely as well due to the previously mentioned mobile games takeover and the PS3's iffy architecture, thus forcing them to frantically cop out in a sense, turning Final Fantasy into a militarized linear sad fest and allowing Keiji Inafune to ruin many a franchise by way of the outsource, like Dead Rising, Bionic Boyo, DMC DMC, and so on. Still, that isn't to say that that said outsourcing can't make for some neat shit. I mean, if Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil and Kingdom Hearts are any indication, quite some interesting games can come out of the blending of cultures when it's done by those who know jack fucking shit about the cultures that they're blending with. So who knows what type of gemmage we may find within the PS3's barely HD bargain bin realm. So while some sources might claim that Front Mission Evolved was entirely outsourced due to a bulk of the development being handled by Double Helix of Silent Hill shitpost fame, Square did actually send over some right boys. It's not like the Konami care package where you just get a wooden crate with one Akira Yamaoka unit inside who would then spend about an hour in a small studio banging his head against his sample pack library. Front Mission Evolved was written by Daisuke Watanabe, who did the scenario writing for most games post Enix, and was produced by Shinji Hashimoto, the man who literally produced every Square game ever made. And as such, it stars a bunch of The Sims looking motherfuckers who talk like Marvel movie marines going to war and oh shit, oh no, oh fuck, this isn't Japanese at all, dear god help me, I'm acting. For what it's worthless though, it's kept a lot of the surface level hallmarks of Front Mission 3. I take it because that's the only reference point what Double Helix had. But the sexy looking wireframe level transitions, the worldly travels, the cheeky banter, the sleek as dick yet plump as fuck mech designs are all present and accounted for. Seriously, even the way the cities are designed in terms of architecture and infrastructure matches up nicely, with the heavy reliances on bright blue glass buildings, steamy sunsets, bright whites and Japanese style recreational nature placements, it looks pretty good. Hell, even the cutscenes have cinematic flare up bump, with the Dutch angles and the tiny big models with the muddy textures and pensions for hokey drama and let's get back to business attitudes with the acronyms rapidly thrown in your face. It's really not as much of a departure as I thought it would be. For better or worse, it looks about what I'd imagine a front mission game would look like on HD hardware. It's just that, <laughs> given the gameplay changes, I don't think many people bother to care. Ever wondered what Armored Core would play like with really smooth controls, much lower difficulties and all of its depth flushed right down the window? Well, that's pretty much what this is, really. You can boost, you can look at bars filling up as funky reticles cover the screen and even spend ages fucking around in the customization menu ripped straight out of Front Mission 3 verbatim. Even the individual body part shit has been left untouched in that each limb is its own destructible and upgradable component as well as you dying when your torso gets fucked, it's just that all of these things will be framed through the iron sights of a fast and frantic shooter. So, smashing a dude with fists will act like more of a splash damage thing due to the arm sweepage, missiles and our timed lock on thingy, and shooting the limbs individually with any form of tact is now nigh on impossible given how fast everything moves. Though, if you had to make a third person front mission game, which they clearly shouldn't have but still, then I would say that this is the way to do it in regards to its foundation. Cause, I mean, not gonna lie. <laughs> 
The game feel in this is downright awesome. You walk like a slow and hulking mech, but you dash hella fast. However, you can only dash for as long as there is bar, which already means need think good. Secondly, the shooting is done with R2 while the charging of the missiles is done by holding down L1 as you fire grenades or gatling guns with R1. This is a really satisfying, tactile and robotic control scheme that sees you hammering down on shoulder buttons to engage offensive sequences, all the while trying to stay mindful of where the fuck you're going and how long you can actually keep on going there as to not end up like a dicking duck dead in the water when boost run out. Additionally, the bleep screeches, crunches and crashes with sparks and debris in tow that made the destructible environments and mechs from Front Mission 3 so bloody satisfying are brought to life here just as well. As I said, it's a lot like an awful man armored core. A metal wolf chaos, if you will. At least on the kinesthetical front. It's really quite cool. Sadly, where things kind of shat the bed a little is with the actual game built around it all. What's funny here is that the enemy setups are also straight ripped from 3. There will always be some missile dudes off in the distance, a few generic shoot man, some tanks and shit, and a hulk boy with mace or big knuckle trying to roll up and punch your ass, and even the situations in which they are placed echo the third installment. You get a defend the bridge, a survive in the hangar with the door locked, the escape the exploding base, and even some levels where you play as a one man guy. It all goes to a good attempt at making a game that flows well, absolutely, it's just that the game itself doesn't really seem to support flow in general. What I mean with that is that while the enemies you fight might fight you differently, the way that you fight them never actually changes due to how cluttered, fast and frantic the whole thing is. And as I was slowly slipping into this catatonic state, I had begun to realize how the enemies also kept getting more and more bullet spongy with every level and Whoa, hey, they, they just reuse the stage, cheeky motherfuckers. What's strange as well is how the game will callously fuck up your wander setups. In a way, this makes sense as it would be equally douchey to drop you into a long-ranged boat fight without giving you at least a rifle or two, but the constant tugging at the ebb and flow of whatever component-based gameplay style you had just gotten used to in terms of shit like missile ranges, boosting speeds and even the amount of damage you can take made for some really stark fucking difficulty spikes that are very not fun. For real, at times the game just screws you over by forcing you to deal with slow legs in a missile dodge heavy level or a glass cannon build during a boss fight. Shit's fucked up and I don't like it. Though I will say that the bosses in question were pretty fucking banging. Again, it's not really a bad game as when the gameplay shines, it shines big and the boss fights polish it up perfectly. Either relying on the fighting your other half theory pitting you up against someone with the same moveset or by having you take down these spectacle ass mobile fortresses, it's always pretty great. Still, unquestionably, my favorite part will always be that one time where shit glitched out and started layering and looping my gun sounds at nauseum. It was epic. It has to be said, sim faces aside, Front Mission Evolved's cutscenes are awesome. I half expected a low budget flick, which you know it is, but it's one with effort. The voice acting is suspect sure, but it fits with the vibes that I got from 3 and just the way how they use Dutch angles and dank lighting to show off the scale of it all. All the while keeping all the model table set designs alive and well as commendable as all dicks. And hey, the story is kind of neat even, boasting characters who have an actual bit of dynamism between them with love triangles and death scenes and villains who are scrumptiously evil. Big booby psycho lady and evil Scarface Nazi man are my faves by far. And like, again, it actually echoes what a front mission game would have looked like in HD, which I think that that's also the thing. It looks like it, it sometimes sounds like it, it sure as shit talks like it, but it doesn't at all play like it. And while the game might be serviceable and even fun for the most part, it's not what people wanted. And I take it that that's why Front Mission Evolved got shat on so much. Not because it's a bad game on its own, repetitive though it may be at times, but because it's a game in a much beloved series that had been tragically neglected by Square for the better half of a decade and left in Japan exclusively for even longer, only for the last entry to be a third person shooter made by the team responsible for Silent Hill shitpost. 
<laughs> yeah. Feel Plus is what I like to call a Japanese shadow company. Much like Tosei, they're a dev mainly tasked with making games under contract for studios like Square or Capcom. With smaller budgets and the director from said bigger dev being shipped on over to oversee development, of course. Feel Plus themselves, for example, gave a hand to Mistwalker in creating Lost Odyssey and even helped out Konami when making a rather extreme game in particular. I guess if there would be a Western comparison, I'd say that it'd be the licensed game studios that publishers like EA and Activision used to gobble up. Which isn't too far off from what Feel Plus did either, as they also created Jew on the Grudge for the Nintendo Wii. A true classic indeed. For some fucking reason though, they too pulled a Tecmo and took a look at the list of things Americans liked and had decided on making a third person shooter while, and I quote, outsourcing the script to an unnamed company from the UK. So basically, we have a shadow company working for a shadow company. I'm, I'm sure this will go just fine. You know, for a game made to look like a western-made product, these character designs sure look suspiciously Japanese. And they're inhabited by people who are very much not Japanese. One of whom is Jim, a human rights activist who's got into quite the spicy pickle involving a not-so-secret agent lady, House of the Dead voice acting, and many a shootbang. Cover-based third-person shootbang, to be exact. But. As the name would imply, it does have a jackingly good gimmick where you hijack people's minds upon low health so you can either third birthday slash modern combat they asses, or recruit them to your very own bad AI army, thus essentially turning every stage into one giant loud shootout where everyone blasts but no one hits. It also has quantum theory's sense of sensitivity as the aiming is stiff as a dick and enemies also don't recoil upon impact, making it rather hard to tell if you're even hitting them at all in the first place. But Fear not, Famborghini, as Mindjack is more or less structured as an all-out balls-to-the-wall, tits-on-the-floor arcade action game, voice acting included. Now what? I need to get inside. Inside? Inside. Not gonna lie, the pacing in this boyo is rock fucking solid. Essentially, the entire game is but a slew of arenas. There's no corridors, other than the ones in between levels with quiet time followed by story as all action takes place in big rooms with cover, clear signifiers that start and end encounters, and points, damage numbers, and all manner of zany Sega-esque UI elements flying all over the place. Sometimes there is just dudes with guns, and other times there is big mechs, helicopters, and ghost lifts. Yeah. In any case, where this does make the game a slight bit repetitive, they do actually do a pretty good job of constantly dishing out new enemy types every two or three levels, increasing intensities and difficulties with each one. You know, like an arcade game. And by the time you actually have like 10 dudes firing at each other as you spend the day awkwardly doing contextual dodge rolls like one light gun ass boy, it actually starts to make up for the not quite bad but certainly iffy game feel. I'm a uh, Gonna pull up the Deadly Premonition comparison here and liken it to that. I mean, DP is also a bad third-person shooter, but it knows it. And so, it has programmed the enemies, built the levels, and structured its pacing around those stuffy controls, thus, when paired with everything else, actually making shit work. And, <laughs> holy shit, what everything else we have here. Rebecca Weiss, don't be scared. Scared? I'm furious. Listen, lady, you're a high-profile activist and your file's got a five-star pain-in-the-ass rating. Yeah, so it has style. Blue on fucking everything. Glass screens and holograms up the bum and Midgar-like billboards, neon signs, pipelines and girders when outside. 
apart, sleek airport metro station and grimy PS1 pre-render looking as cityscapes. There isn't much exploration due to its structure sadly, but it does have that Ari of the Deadly premonition to your writing to make up for it. Like, <laughs> these actors clearly were just some white people plucked off of the Tokyo streets. And the soundtrack is also on constant fist bump level. My Jack just exudes so bad it's good out of its every goth architecture laden big airport looking ass pores. In a weird way, it actually reminds me a lot of Dirge of Cerberus. I mean, the gunships, mech turrets, and color schemes are literally exactly the same. Though luckily, it doesn't take itself as seriously. My Jack knows what it is and is therefore only like 5 hours long. Like I said, arcade game. And by far the most fun I've had in a while with an all-out dumpster fire of this magnitude. It's dumb, fast, loud, stylish, and about as shallow as a kiddie pool, but even those can still be fun if you bring enough guns along. Oh god. <laughs> Fuck, that joke was dark. In any case, for a game that Angry Joe called the worst game ever made and labeled by the angry fedora neckbeard man as fucking bad, 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 bad. That's actually quite fun. Don't listen to them. I am the true messiah. What did we learn from all of this, though? Well, mainly that this era in gaming is about as mediocre as I remember it to be, but that there is also some slight nuggage to be found regardless. Also, uh... Vanquish came out of this, which some people like, I think. Never Dead by Konami seems interesting too, and Sega also came out swinging with Binary Domain, which was originally going to be the fourth game what I wanted to cover, but to my surprise it's both long and good enough to warrant its own video one day. Though, uh, <laughs> I'm about done with third-person shooters for a good while and will thus leave it here. Maybe next time we can actually take a look at that Silent Hill shitpost that the Double Helixes were doing, I, I don't know. Maybe that could be fun. I'll probably regret that. But either way, I love you. I am now backing away from the microphone. Goodbye. Thanks for watching.